Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Jim Bubba Bay, has a miraculous story that will just keep you mesmerized as you listen to this newfound friend of mine. You see, he lost his two sons. They died, and that uh, caused the division of his marriage. He suffered from a traumatic injury. He was essentially left for dead. And he was in a coma for seven days. During that time, he's going to tell us how he met God and the two love of his life, that is his two boys. So it's Bubba. I want to call you Bubba because that's that's how you go by. But it's, it's great to have you with us today. And uh, thank you for joining us. That, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here, Bubba. And so here you are uh, living a life uh, uh, that is uh, perhaps God, honoring to God as a father and a husband. And yet you didn't know the Bible well or much at all, that is. And um, then you had uh, these traumatic events uh, involving your two sons. So. Let's begin with what happened to really uh, create a tumultuous uh, a breakdown of the family. Well, it started back in uh, 2000. My, my, my one son, Logan, was born in 1997. And uh, me and my wife, I had old, two, two older boys were my stepson. We weren't married at the time. They never met their father. They, you know, my ex-wife and, you know, that was her son. And she had them at a young age and she did an amazing job raising them. And uh, so they, since they never met their father, I, I, I told them, uh, you know, they can call me Jim. They were like eight, seven, eight years old. And, you know, I said, and uh, it really touched my heart though. A couple of times I went to pick them up. They didn't know I was there. And they said, my dad's coming to get me. So, but in, 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 in you know, when the thing they would say, Jim, you know, and so I, that's the way I wanted it, you know? And uh, so we had, uh, my son Logan was born. And then I don't know, it felt like um, all your eggs are in one basket when I, I, I had three kids, they were like my kids too, but biologically you have all, all your eggs in one basket. So I, uh, we decided we wanted to have another child and uh, we ended up having my uh, son, James. He, he was, uh, sadly, he was born uh, premature. He was only uh, 23 and a half weeks uh, uh, old, you know, gestational age. And uh, he was born one pound, four ounces. And he was born in uh, 2000. And, and so we uh, decided that we would, uh, you know, do uh, the best we could. And he lived 10 days in the, uh, you know, the NICU there. And then he passed away, sadly, uh, from, uh, he, I got told when he was, uh, he was, you know, being C-section, I was in, in getting the scrubs on and with, you know, and then going to the operating room with my wife there. And uh, I was told he didn't have much of a chance and, but the amazing things is, you know, he was born with all his fingers, all his toes, all the hair, and never got to see his eyes because they were closed. So um, we were going to name James after me, but not Junior. We didn't. We don't do Juniors in my family. We all just had different. So uh, we never had a middle name. And uh, the night he was born, they came in and said, you have to give the name, you know, and said James and my wife and I. And I know we didn't have one up. And then we came up with Ulysses. Uh, to give him power, you know, we thought, hey, it might give him some power or something. So his name was James Ulysses Bay, and sadly he died after ten days. Um, that was rough because my wife pretty much was in one hospital, my son was in the other hospital, and then my, you know, my three kids, the other kids were home. So it was like driving around like a madman. Uh, it, it was uh, incredible, and I wish it on no one because it was just uh, life destroying, you know, changing, and uh, but. I did uh, one one thing that really was neat. Uh, he was having a really bad day one time and I'm a horrible singer, horrible. And he was, you know, he was in a room with all the other babies and everybody had the little areas in the NICU. And uh, I got there and I, I made up a song for him, uh, you know, and like I said, I'm a horrible singer. 
And actually I got there and his numbers came up on all the monitors that I was there singing to him. And uh, so that was a neat uh, experience for me and to learn that that stuff really does happen and stuff. So I was very uh, emotional. And then uh, when it came time, they called us and it, I'm a big Met fan and I know it's hard. It's like, oh, being a Met fan's rough, but anyway, for baseball, but they were playing, it was back when they started playing the Yankees during the regular season. And uh, it was a Saturday and they called, uh, I would, I, I, he was so bad Friday night, they wouldn't let me drive home. They made me sleep at the hospital. I was pretty devastated. And uh, so they, they, there was like a parent's room, but it was taken already. So they put a, like a chair in a room and the recliner kind of thing. And I slept in a chair overnight and then it, he, I got up and it seemed like he was doing a little better. And then about five hours later, we got that call that uh, he wasn't going to make it and permission to come down and pull the, you know, the, all the plugs and all the machines off him. Uh, it's the first time we got to hold them and I held them and stuff. And then my, uh, I, I decided that I, and I still, to my mind, I, I see him moving around all these years later. So I decided that I didn't want to be there to watch him take his last breath or whatever. So uh, my brother held him. So, uh, which is pretty emotional, but uh, he, he held him. And then we had a grave and then we buried him and the process, God's amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have the best relationship with God. Not that I, not that I was a bad boy and like that. I just, I didn't go to church. I, I, I tell everybody I was a Christian Christian before my, my experience. Cause I would go to church on Christmas and Easter. That was my, you know, and I didn't know the Bible. And, uh, but, uh, it, when you look back on things, it's like God knew it all came for a reason. And, and I know this might sound crazy, but little did we know our, one of our oldest, my stepson's had kidney disease since birth. So he, he was going to, he had this kidney disease that was terminal, basically, you know, uh, either dialysis or, you know, kidney transplant and everything, you know, and hopefully live a long time, but there was no cure in him, you know, in a sense, we didn't know that at the time. And we found out soon after my one son died that our other son had kidney disease. So it was just, I mean, talk about getting hit by two ball, two by four in the head a couple of times. But while we buried my one son, James, they, I, I'm bringing this up for a reason. The, it was so tiny, the little casket, and it, it was amazing. And uh, they, they came up and said, we don't wish you any bad luck, but you can bury somebody full size in the same grave because he's so tiny. And we don't wish you bad luck. And then uh, so my son died, and then our son Robert had kidney disease that we found out soon at like five months later or four and so i mm -hmm. i sometimes i think it it was like we couldn't handle both of them you know we just couldn't handle both of them and maybe we could i you know people handle a lot of stuff but i, I part of me thinks i don't know would have been really rough uh they pretty much thought m my son james if he lived it was going to be you know he was going to need a lot of help maybe we get lucky that he didn't but there was odds are they chance are he would need help and and then my son Robert with the kidney disease was get it, it just like wow we, you know next thing you know we're uh, kidney experts because uh, not that we're experts but we we uh, my wife at the you know Yanina she was driving back and forth an hour and something to the hospital and taking him up because that was the nearest one for the the children he was like twelve years old and pediatric kidney place and it, it was just crazy a lot of miles a lot of. And so we decided to do the peritoneal at home and uh, we had to get trained and they, we even had to buy a different home. They came to our house. We had a little cottage. It, 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 it was so tiny, but everybody was happy there because like my Robert and John are twins. They each got their little spot and their little space. And, you know, everybody had the little room and it was tiny and, uh, but it was ours, you know, and uh, they came to the house and they said, you can't do it at, at home the supplies would take up your living room. That's how small it was. How old uh, Bubba was Robert at this time? He he was like 12, I believe. The numbers, sometimes I lose track. I got a brain injury from accident, but it was around 12. Yeah, but, well, no, but it was two, he was like 13, 12 or 13, right around there. Because he was born in 87 and all this happened 2000, two, you know, around there, 2000. Yeah, 2000. And, um, so then Robert had, uh, 
you know, kidney disease, you know, we found he had kidney disease. And then, uh, so we started doing the peritoneal at home and, uh, one night the machine didn't work and, uh, I had to be the machine. I had to go in and filter them in and take it out. And, you know, so my Yanina at the time worked at a, you know, overnight. So she would call me every hour or whatever, however long I had to do it, I forget, but I would get woken up and go and be the machine for them that night. But they really did. So we had to buy another home as part of my deal. And and then that was crazy too, because then we became landlords because the other one didn't sell. And it, it, it was like, wow, it was like getting hit over two by four and trying to still, you know, and then you have your all, all your other kids. And then uh, we went to the gynecologist and he told us um, that, because we were thinking about not having any more kids because, you know, uh, but he, he told us that yeah, really, you know, if you want one, this is, you should do it soon. And so my daughter, Lauren was born, uh, in 01. So all this was happening. And then, uh, the crazy thing is Lauren was also premature. And, uh, and then, so the same doctor in the middle of the night came from Vassar, Poughkeepsie and the same, Amb they, the same doctor showed up for our son, James. And then showed up for Lauren, the same exact doctor. And mm -hmm. when James is born, we, we thanked him and we said, we hope we never see you again. And then when he was bit, died, he happened to be working that night. And I said, I'm sorry to take this, but I hope I never see you again. Because then it seems like something bad's happening. But he did. Mm -hmm. He literally came the same thing. And uh, my daughter, the amazing thing is my daughter went to the NICU. And they usually tell you they get out. I forget the thing, but it's like their normal gestational stage is like, 40 weeks or whatever so if somebody's born you know 32 weeks normally they're at the NICU for eight I guess or something like that I, I think I something like that anyway so I went down to get my to visit my daughter and she was disappeared and I my my, my heart was in my my feet I was like mm. what happened and um come to find out my daughter was so advanced that she was eating them at a house and home and uh they moved her to the good to, to the good room. I never got to experience the good room in the NQ, you know, where your, your, your child's getting better. So mm -hmm. I, I, I was like devastated for her not to be where she is. I thought she died too. And, uh, she ended up being in the good room. I never got to experience that to her. And, uh, and then they called us soon after and said, you got to come get her. She just eaten us out of house and home. And so it, it turned out we had a healthy baby one. Uh, and she was only there like 10 days too, I think. My son James was there 10 days and died. My daughter was there 10 days and lived. So then it was all, yeah. So it was, so now we got, you know, a newborn and all that, but we were getting older too. You know, we're starting out, we, we didn't want to be too old of our parents. And um, I was in my thirties already. And my wife was a couple years younger than me. And I think we we're both in our thirties at that time. And so we didn't want to wait too long. So now we have a stomach kidney disease or one son died and, and then I, I didn't know it. I, we, me and my wife had a good relationship and we did talk, but um, we ended up trying to move to Arizona. We lived there for a year uh, when my sons graduated, the older ones. We waited until they graduated. And uh, John decided to stay here. And Robert with kidney disease wanted to, you know, he, he came to Arizona with us, but not with us. So he was... Uh, he wanted to go to a diesel mechanic school and it was in Avondale and we lived in Queen Creek. Uh, if we knew more now, I don't know if we would have really allowed him to be on his own per se, because um, uh, that's a lot of responsibility to peritoneal having to do it every night and all that. Anyway, we, we made a rule uh, that when we went to visit him, depending on Phoenix traffic, because we had to go through Phoenix to get to Avondale, uh, it could take a little while, but we made a rule that uh, one of us would go and our younger kids would not go in case something ever was bad. If we didn't hear from him and we didn't hear from him and my good friend that I met out there, we worked together at the Home Depot. Uh, he, uh, We were going out on the boat. I, I My mind was blown that there's like these lakes and it, Arizona to me is like the desert and there's all these lakes you can go boating on. And so it, I, I kind of was like mind blown at him on a boat in Arizona in the desert, you know, but, uh, we were going to go on a boat ride. Hmm. So my uh, wife wanted to take, so she took the kids with him and we hadn't heard Robert in four days and she found him dead in his apartment, uh, oh which is, which is, uh, 
horrible. Hor it's just we never talked about it. We never talked what she saw. But after the fact, it, it, they treated it as a crime scene because no one had seen him. And uh, she, he was like three or four days dead on, on the kitchen floor. And so you can any mother's nightmare right there, you know, yes. besides her one son dying, he, he passed away. How old was he when he passed away, Bubba? He was he was eighteen. He was eighteen. Mm. And and an amazing thing is, you know, we we never know how long we got, how many days we got, or whatever. But uh, I was struggling. I was supposed to have this job and land because I'm a landscaper by trade, and and then I got there, and then that salary changed, and the whole dynamics of the job changed. And the head guy said, "I don't know if you want to work here because this guy's like." bipolar it seems he seems he's happy one day and then he starts yawning another day so i started to get skittish like should i be taking this job so now i don't have a job so i tried selling meat and this is before this i was a shy guy during before my you know meeting god and everything like that and then uh so i i did meet i so tried selling meat on a truck and it wasn't me but i did it for a little while like a week or two and i teamed up with this guy and we actually we sold some meat that day so my why i'm bringing it up Cause it really, it's, it, it touches my heart. Really, really. It's it just like, I'm so glad I, I've made some serious bad decisions in my life, but this is one I'm so glad. Anyway, we sold some meat and then we split the proceeds that day. We got paid and then you just claim it. And I, it wasn't much like a hundred bucks or something like that, but I had no job. So a hundred bucks was a lot. And I got out and I was between Avondale and home, like pretty much halfway. And I could take that hundred bucks home to, they're all my family, but to, you know, the homestead with, you know, my wife and all that, or I could go to the Avondale and my buy a coat for my son, Robert, and take him out to lunch. So I decided to go to Avondale, buy a coat and take him out to lunch. And literally it was like a week or two before he passed away. Mm. And uh, we had a wonderful time and uh, I, I spent all the money on him and I gave him the other what little money was left. I said, here you go. So I made all that meat. So it just like, it really like um, I, I I just treasure that like decision that I made the right one that day. Little did I know he was going to die. Yeah, you never know. There's no promise of a tomorrow, especially someone who has a serious uh, illness like Robert uh, had. And um, uh, you've had two tragedies up to this point, and I find it very interesting, by the way, that you said, Baba, that. You were very shy um, before your encounter with God. So yeah. that's a tramf transformation we'll get to here in a, in a while. But more to the uh, immediate of where we are at this point, and that is that uh, the stresses of Robert's illness and then eventually dying, and then James as an infant uh, dying as well and having to bury him and uh, Robert's body, uh, that takes a stress on the marriage, doesn't it? it? It sure does. It sure does. And a little did I know in the end that we actually moved to Arizona to, I know that sounds crazy. We really did have a great relationship. We never fought. My wife and I, we never fought. We fought one time at the end and it was a raise the boys. It never was a, you know, get mad at each other. We didn't, it just, we didn't, I don't know why. Maybe all this stuff happened and kept us busy doing you know taking care of things and we didn't have time to fight i don't know but we, we get along now too so you know and everything but uh yeah it just uh come to find out we moved to arizona to try to my wife wanted to turn a new leaf you know like our son james died or our son had kidney disease maybe maybe try a new new area and she had a good friend out there and we went out and visited and uh it was nice i liked it but i was like a fish out of water I'm a New York boy, a country boy. I mean, we have one traffic light in our whole town. And now we're, you know, you know, checking out Phoenix with all this 10, you know, 10 lane highways and stuff. And so I was a fish out of water. But I have to say for Bubba, it was other than my, I always say this, other than my son dying out there, it was the best thing that ever happened to Bubba. I, I, I really, uh, I really grew, you know, I really grew up more and, really just became a better man and a better person uh, uh, to learn what's out there. And I, I, I work for my brother landscape and I, I did before and I do now. And that one year I didn't. And uh, I also, we have a family gas station and uh, it, we've had it for 58 years. And anyway, we, uh, 
I, I, it's funny. I, I've done hundreds of interviews, but I never got interviewed because I never had to get interviewed because I worked for my brother, you know, uh, right out of college. So hmm. I, I, you know, I had to go for interviews and, you know, all that experience, you know, and then I got the job at Home Depot. But it, I, other than my son dying, which outweighs how great it was for me, I'd have my son back and give back all the growth. And I, I, I you know, I'd give it up in a day, but I, I did it really turned out to be quite the, I mean, I don't know many, I don't even know when we wrote it in, in, in the book we wrote, my friend and I, but uh, I, I, I do say I, I moved my family and my wife, the two of us, cross country, uh, lock, stock and barrel, filled up a tractor trailer and they delivered the thing and all that. 11 months, we moved from New York to Arizona, then back from Arizona to New York. And what happened was when we were, in Arizona, what happened was we lived in Arizona. Um, remember, they said we could bury another full size. And we're like, well, the really neat thing was we never had a gravestone. We, we couldn't do it yet with my son, James. So we didn't have no stone there. My son just was there. And uh, and then when my son, Robert, died, we knew where we had to take him. We had to bring him back to New York. Um, and it's you have to buy this, get this special casket where it's all locked and sealed and he flew on the plane. Uh, I don't. I don't quite remember what same plane we did or another plane. But anyway, they flew him back. So we flew back, and then uh, my son John's, of course, going to college here. His twin brother, and and then we uh, had buried him and all that stuff. And then we went back to Arizona, and both my wife at the time, Yanina, and I looked at each other. We basically said, "What?" I mean, I really had a good friend, Brian Tanner, out there. Him and I were getting really close. We worked together and I, I, you know, I really liked that guy. And, uh, we, uh, but other than that, which what's, you know, what's, what's in Arizona to keep us when our two sons are buried in New York and our other son, John is here. And of course our Logan and Lauren are both with us, you know? So, yeah. So we just, I don't know. We just decided that we would come back. And, um, but in the process of that, all that stuff that wears on people, that's, I could talk to people a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff's happened to me. Uh, financially, we got devastated. Uh, we, when my son got kidney disease, we had the best insurance you could have. We have New York state insurance at the time. And uh, my wife worked for the state. And, but the problem is, is that the co-pays will eat you up if you have, we have like 15 different meds and every copay, 15 bucks here, 15 bucks there, 20 bucks for the doctor. And then all the gas and everything. Yeah, it, it basically, if, if you're not really, really wealthy and you could have the best insurance in the world, it's a slow financial death. It, it, it just, it just wears on you, wears on you. Then you're set up. If, if you make one bad decision, like I shouldn't have brought that $10 pair of pants or something like that. It, it, it could snowball harder. And we, we made some bad decisions, you know, we're, we're not perfect. And, you know, like you, uh, we, we should go to eat because everybody's, you know, not happy. And so you go out to eat and you put it on a credit card and next thing you know, it just snowballs. So between everything and so that started to wear on us. And uh, so we ended up losing our home in Arizona. It was, you know, it was like leave the home and lose it or, you know, go back where family is. And then, uh, like I said before, we had two homes here. See, that was the mistake. I didn't know that you could get a home built and put your five thousand dollars down, whatever. And then if something really bad happens, you could just say, keep my 5,000. I'm sorry, I just can't get it. I thought you put the money down, you have to go get it and you have to fulfill the, you know, your, your obligation. And so no one told me that, uh, that you, you know, didn't need to do that, you know? And so the idea was for our homes to sell here and then just buy the one out there. We had e equity in both homes here. And uh, it was a time just when the market was about to crash in the real estate market. And so, yeah, so we end up losing everything, you know? Oh my goodness. Yeah. You well, had a yeah. lot of stresses, Bubba, that in, in your life, my goodness, uh, all of these kind of converging at roughly the same time. Now, many people, uh, with whom I've interviewed have, uh, had either a relationship with Jesus Christ as, um, uh, whether they attend church, studying the Bible, what have you, but that wasn't the case for you, really, was it? You called yourself uh, uh, somebody who went to church on on uh, Christmas and Easter 
and some call that the creasters, you know, the ones that, yeah. that just go those two, uh, to, for those two events. Uh, and that's kind of how you fit into it. So you didn't even have at that point, um, that, that foundation, uh, that you have now that wasn't there for you as solidly as you had certainly after meeting God. Um, so, uh, back to your marriage, which is stressed from all of these things. Um, at this point you're headed toward another travesty, aren't you? Yeah. I, I just want to go back a little bit. I did. I did. Uh, when I went to Arizona, I, I metal tech is my big hobby. I'm just uh, not, I, I dig out houses and I'm, I'm just a nut. been doing it for 30 something years. And my oldest coin is 1710. I got a bunch of 1700 coins and counterfeits. And I just, it's my passion at that. And my Corvair now I got brought myself a Corvair. So old cars and old things are my passion. Anyway, I, I started to get this thing happen. So we moved from Elizaville to Arizona and we, we packed. I packed this box of all my uh, metal detecting books and magazines and one by one, I put them in there and locked it, closed the thing, taped it all up. We got to Arizona there at that job. I talked about how I didn't end up getting it. I, I got offered the job. I declined the job because the guy said, oh, the guys. And I'm like, do I really want to get involved in that? And, and the pay was like $12,000 less than what was promised to me. And it just seemed like, yeah, things didn't add up. So I got really depressed because I had I hadn't had a job since I was 19, you know, and that was in uh, 2006. So I'm I'm born in 65. So I don't know whatever the math is. Anyway, I wasn't you know like, you know it's the first time I had a job. So after a while, I kind of lost. Um, I started to get depressed, uh, you know, badly. Like it started to affect me. Like I'm, you know, and it's not even like I'm the man because it's a team effort. It's just like I wasn't doing my part, you know. And uh, so I decided that I would open this, you know, I had a metal detector or anything, and I'd open up this box and, and read, you know, some metal detecting or look at some finds. So I opened the box up, and in the box is this little tiny book that I, no one, you know, I don't know how I got there, but it got there. I'm the one that packed the box. It's, it wasn't in the box when I taped it, but Bruce Wilkinson's Prayer of Jabez was in the box. And it's the little book, and I said, "Oh, I, I guess I got to read this." I, I didn't put it in there. My wife didn't put. We had it. We didn't even own a copy. This is it, it's mind blowing. This is the one thing that you know. It, it's 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 even more mind blowing than what had really happened to me. Anyway, so I read the book, and it, boy, it really hit home with me. It, it just gave me. In which book was this? A uh, Prayer of Jabez by Bruce Wilkinson. Ah, Prayer of Jabez. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Expanding. And, and what, that was a book. Yeah. Uh, it was and, written by Wilkerson yeah. about expanding one's territory in the kingdom. Yeah, yep, yep. And 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 what I got out of the book, because if you say if, if you say the prayer, some people are like, oh, you look for 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 uh, you know monetary or you know possession material. What I got out of the book is you pray, you say the prayer, and you're like, here I am, God, I'm ready to do your work, whatever you want me to do. Now I got, I so I started saying the prayer every morning, and and and. It, it was my started to become my my connection with God. Uh, I, I I started praying a little more and started. It became a routine for me to say it, and I said it every morning and every night when I went to bed. And uh, but I was confused because I'm like, yeah, and it made me feel good. It just made me feel good to say the prayer, and you know. And then I started to learn to pray for some people. I I I, I haven't been a good prayer. I wasn't a good prayer up to this point. I mean, I believed in it and all that. I just you know, I just never did it. And then, uh, anyway, so, but I was confused, like, you know, Jim Bay, he, you know, Jim Bay, he doesn't even know the Bible. I, I couldn't quote you, a, I, to this day, I still couldn't quote you scripture, or I, I couldn't even tell you how it all wrote, went down. And I, I've heard bits and pieces, you know, up to that point, but I couldn't tell you anything, you know, anything. And I mean, I could give you a hug or a smile if you wanted, you know, and I know that's all part of being God and doing godly things. And, Jesus and God and doing all that, but I, I, I couldn't do anything. So I, but I kept praying. I was faithful. I kept saying, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do because what I got like, like that one guy in the book, they did a, uh, you know, a youth group and 
you know, it, it was a small youth group. And then he, he started praying the prayer. And next thing you know, they got bigger. And then they needed a bigger building. And the more kids came. And, you know, so I'm like, oh, you know, and it was all for God. I, but I just kept praying. And, you know, and so that that was my, uh, yeah, that was my real first connection with, you know, God. And then I started to add Christian music into the mix. Uh, you know, being, uh, listening to Christian music, prayer and the prayer, but that's about as far as I was. And I scratched my head though. I, I would, when I was alone or I can't, cause I came back and started landscaping again and we, we build walls we do all the landscaping and then we mow lawns and I'd be on the mower and I'm like, I'd say the prayer then. And I'd be like, well, I wonder what I'm going to do for God. I don't know, you know, but here I am. I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe, maybe I just help somebody walk across the street. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, that, that was life changing for me, you know, that book. And so. Did you ever question why God would take your two sons? Uh, no. Or did that question not, that may be an unfair statement to say that he took your two sons, uh, that your, he would allow, let's say that your two sons would, um, would die. Did you ever question guy, God, why did you allow this to happen? No, no, I I'm upset. I, I, I never got mad at God. I never, cause I didn't really have a big relationship with him, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, I didn't get mad and I, I come from a family. My father, uh, his father died at 16. My father was 16 years old. His father had dropped, died, died of a heart attack. So my father became the man of the family. My father would go to work before school, go to school, go to football practice, go to work after and just repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse, you know, and he, he had an older sister and his mother and he'd bring home all the money he could make and give it to his mother, you know, and, uh, and then his father's father died before 40 and the father, you know, there was three in a row all died before 40. So we walked around in eggshells. When my dad started pushing 40, we were, you know, walking around in eggshells at our house, no celebration, no birthday celebration. No, you know, we, we, we just were, Oh, he made it to that. And, you know, by the grace of God, he's 83 today, you know, 84, I think 84 now. And, and, uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, so, I think that a little bit of that in me, uh, I've never said in any interview, but having that being part of a family, never met my grandfather and my dad going through all what he did. My dad never, never took, said it was negative, never brought it out negative. He just wishes that we would be able to be able to meet our grandfather. And, and uh, he, he always was positive behind it and stuff like that. And I think that was a lesson, you know, that if anybody, my dad, you know, could, can, you know, be mad at God or something like that. Cause my dad did go to church and he did, you know, they, he, he did all that and, and he wasn't. So I, it didn't enter my mind. It really didn't. I do think um, when you lose somebody or you lose a, a child and stuff like that, and, and even a second one, I know a family that lost four kids. So it, it, it's brutal. It's hard, but, but losing one's the same as losing two, you know, it, it is, it's the same motions. I, I, uh, it, it just, the one thing that does help is having other kids to look up at you and go, I need a hug. And, you know, kids that are living still that need you, you know, because yeah. you have to strap on your boots and go again, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we still had three kids living, uh, you know, kept us busy, you know, so there wasn't a lot of time to, you know, poor me or whatever like that. Yeah. Well, there was a, um, another fatality of sort, if you will. And that was that you went through a, uh, a divorce. Yeah. Yeah. Well, te it's kind of funny. Technically. Yeah. A big split up. We're, we're legally technically still married. We've been oh, apart okay. For six, Separation we've been apart, then. Yeah. We, we've been apart for like 16 years or okay. whatever, but it, it, yes, yes, it was right after like we came back and, and it was time. It was time and we didn't fight. It was just time. It was, I don't know whether everything wore down on us that there was no energy to fight to about anything. It was just time. It was dead. I was devastated though. I mean, we both were, but I was devastated. I'm like my daughter. I, you know, you know, uh, I would put her to bed and I'd say, see you later. And I'd get her and she'd say, in a while, crack a dial, you know, and then that's going to stop because I won't see her every day because the right thing to do whoever's leaving whether it's the mother or the father because sometimes it's the other way around 
you know, you leave your kids in the room they know, you know, the bedrooms they know and the house they know and 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 you leave, you know. So it just was time. Uh and uh and this whole story and why you got me on the channel is why I'm still legally married. Uh it became more important to try to get better myself physically than worrying about being divorced. You know what I mean? So it kind of took a back burner on the plate. You know, I do say in other interviews I was divorced. I tell people I'm divorced, but you know, uh, you know, we're working on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was that fateful day that everything changed for you. Everything. And I mean, this is, this is a pretty horrific uh, story. Um, you're with us today, but something happened and, and I'll let you obviously share what that is that left you to the point of, uh, of death. So I, I, I ended up splitting up from my wife and, uh, my brother and sister-in-law, John and Marianne owned a house next to our shop and it was vacant. And, uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it because now my landlord and my, not only my brother and my sister-in-law, he's my boss and she's the one that signs the paychecks and another like boss. And then they're going to be my landlord. That's a lot, you know, uh, not a lot of connections. And, uh, but at the time it was the best I could do. So, uh, and it's a big house. And at the time rents were reasonable. <laughs> so I was able to rent the whole house. And uh, what felt good for me was that there was rooms for Logan and Lauren, the younger ones. Uh, John was off in college and Robert, of course, was not here and James not here. So I had the two bedrooms and then John knew to come. He could come anytime to visit and stuff. And uh, so it put me on Hammertown Road is the point, uh, which is our shops on Hammertown Road. And uh, so I moved in. And then when you go from all that that you have been talking to me about and I've been telling my story to now it's you, just you, other than work, man, there's a lot of time to fill up, you know, a lot of downtime, a lot of, uh, I, I, I cried myself to sleep the first night I was in my bed here because my kids weren't with me and uh, just everything hit home. And uh, so Bubba, I've been a big guy from, I, I lost a hundred something pounds of college and I got down and I experienced, you know, but overall, I, I was, a, I've been a big guy most of my life, you know, and uh, Bubba comes from all stems from all that and the football and all that uh, story I told you before. Anyway, so I ended up, uh, I decided that I would walk. I just would walk. So I ended up walking uh, six miles a day uh, after, after work, after working all day and a lot of exercise, I would walk more and i started doing that and then i said to myself you got to really get back to metal detecting and um you're going to make it a a purpose one weekend day on the weekend saturday or sunday whatever works out you're going to go for the whole day you're going to pack a lunch and you're just going to go and then if i had my kids i didn't go of course but this is when i'm free so it november 15 2009 i went metal detecting it was a gorgeous fall. Fall is my favorite time of the year for metal detecting everything. And uh, so I went to my friend's house, metal detecting. He had a 1700 home and, and I, I had, a, I, I didn't do great in fines. Didn't have this banner day, but I found a bunch of nice stuff there too earlier other times and all that. And then, uh, so I stayed there though. I, I kept, you know, detecting all day and, you know, and uh, so I decided no exercise that night, nothing, you know, I, I got enough and, uh, so I came home and the funny thing about it is my mom and dad and was, we were living in Las Vegas for part of the year uh, because my mom's sister lived out there and they reconnected and my cousin had brought a house that my mom and dad could stay in and stuff. So they had a place to live out there and they came to Pine Plains to visit and their house is three miles away. They never sold it, but they said, let's go visit Jim. It'll be like we're on vacation. So they came to stay at my house. So they were living with me at the time for two weeks. And I bring that up for a reason. So I got home from metal attack and I'm a horrible cook. You know, on my own, I I made tuna specials and I just, I, I'm not a good cook, you know? So 
my mom and dad went out to visit friends to have dinner. So I was by myself. So I made some, made, made some not so great tuna fish and uh, I ate it and then I didn't feel well. And it was Sunday night. And I knew for me, if, if I didn't like get some exercise or get some air, I was just going to roll around in bed, roll around in bed, roll around in bed. It'd be forever before I get to sleep. And I knew we had a big day on the next day, uh, cleaning leaves and all that stuff. And I wanted to be rested. So I said to my mom, I said, hey, mom, I'm going to go for a walk. I don't walk around this house, Hammertown, because there's no street lights. There's nothing here. I get in my car and I drive to Pine Plains, park in my mom and dad's house. And you walk around the street lights and the sidewalks. But I wasn't going for a walk. I was just going. I had gas and feeling my stomach and just to feel better. So I decided to walk this road. And uh, so and it's a dead end. I Our house, now it's the second house on the left, but originally it was the first house. So I said, I'll walk out towards the entrance and there's a town all across the way with street lights or not street, tra you know, like lights in their parking lot. So I said, I'll go there. So I got my stuff on. My mom knew I went for a walk. My dad had no idea I went for a walk. So I went out down there and I went a little bit of the ways and I got to the main road almost. And um, it was, a, I guess it was getting foggy foggier but i didn't really realize it at the time that it was getting foggy in a way but i got to the road and on the side of the road this drunk guys you know they were they were rowdy and you know making all this noise and maybe even going to the bathroom because they really had to go or getting sick i don't know but it, it just didn't seem like you didn't want to approach them and just like here i am in the dark you know because there's no track in the street light so i decided i'd turn around so I turned around and uh, I came back to my house past, and then there's a little hill pit in front of my house. And I had never really been down there in cars. My sister lived down there for a while, but never really walked the road much at all. So I said, well, you know, I can go a little further. I'll go down the hill. I'll go a little bit, turn around, come back. That was the plan. And uh, yeah, the plan didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. So, uh, I ended up going past what turned out to be my neighbor's house and uh, went a little bit further. And then I said, that's enough. And when I walk at night, I, I walk towards traffic, especially when there's no lights. You know, I walk, I walk on the road side of the road that you're supposed to. So I crossed the road and I said, that's enough. I'm going home. If I roll around, I roll around. But anyway, so I started walking up the hill. Uh, I, started, no, I started, I didn't get to the hill. So I turned around and I looked and I'm walking a little bit and I see traffic like car lights. And uh, we have the biggest entranceway and a lot of people turn around at our entranceway because they're all of a sudden they're on a dead end road. They're like, no, we don't want to be here because the next literally like, I don't know, four or 500 feet is the main exit to get on the uh, county road or state road. It's actually a state road. So like, I think some people, people turn too soon thinking that's the exit and then they realize and they turn around. So anyway, I saw car lights coming and at night, when I walk, and especially when there's no lights, I decide, you to me, you don't want to keep walking towards them. As the car comes down closer, then there's less time for everybody to react. So I, I, what I do is I get off the road and I stop, you know, and I just stand there and I, I make sure I'm plenty far off the road and then I stop. So that was the plan. And I took a step, like, to my left. And ne next thing you know, I slip. And next thing you know, I was flying through the air. It was like the uh, the whole, uh, like it was, it literally was like the earth opened up, opened up. And uh, yeah, sometimes I think about it, it kind of brings back memory. And, uh, anyway, so yeah, it was like the earth just opened up and I'm flying. And I, because of the way I stumbled, I went head first through the air. So I, uh, and it was dark, so I didn't, I couldn't see where I was, you know, um, and, and I, it, thankfully it was dark. There's a reason behind that, but so I ended up free falling head first. Uh, my feet went 14 feet. My head went 19 feet, 20 feet. And uh, I, hit, I hit rock. My head hit first. My, my left side of head's caved in. It hit rock. And then I hit my left shoulder, my left ribs, and I and then my my left hip and my my left leg. 
this the right side of the body never hit the ground. And uh and then I became unconscious. Now, as far as time, there's no time's irrelevant. Time it, I know it sounds crazy because I ended up bleeding really bad, but I, I lost all track of time. All this stuff, this time now is I, I just don't know how long I was unconscious. It could have been a blip, it could have been 10 seconds, it could have been a minute or or whatever, but I was knocked out unconscious. And then I uh, came to, and uh, at some point I came to, and I knew I was in trouble. I was hurting, like I was hurting. Mm. I was right. I was wrecked. And uh, I felt all this liquid around me. It ended up being my blood. And then I, uh, let's just say my tears join the blood after i realized you know how my situation uh and so i i was laying on rocks basically and uh so my intuition was so i was able to reach up on my right arm because that wasn't broken and i reached up to my scalp and my fingers went in my skull and i knew i was in trouble i had been a basketball coach for 10 years or so i took first aid and I knew you, you, you're you not supposed to move anybody hits their head, their back, their neck, or anything like that. You're not supposed to do any movement or anything like that. Hmm. So, but anyway, I reached in and my fingers went pretty far in my skull and I knew I was in, uh, I was in trouble. So then some of the stuff I thought about, you know, you could give it up to God or whatever like that. I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, there's one claim to fame that God, you know, came a little later, but, Anyway, I'll tell that real soon. But anyway, so I, I, my, my first thought was cell phone. I really did. I, I had a cell phone, but it was a flip phone. And then I don't know how I thought of this, but I really did think of this. Like, how would I find it? Unless somebody called me, it doesn't light up. You know, it just it's the dark. And you know, so I gave, I passed on that. I said, no, nope, that's a waste of time. And meanwhile, I'm bleeding, and I started thinking about, you know, my options and. My life started to, it didn't go in front of me right then that second, but it was coming. But, uh, and then I decided I would yell out and I thought that's the thing, you know, to do. So, and I really did include God in my yelling. I said, Oh God, help me, please. God help me all different variations. And I might've included God in everyone. Maybe not. Maybe I could have just said help, but I know I use God often in my yells. Now it's a dead end road. There's no street lights. There's no traffic lights. There's no houses near or there. And I fell off the face of the earth. So mm -hmm. the odds are anybody hearing me are slim, but I yelled as loud as I can. And then after a little while, I realized that I thought I was yelling loud, but it wasn't very loud and it was getting lower and lower every time. Well, it ended up being all the broken ribs I had, uh, you know, so I ended up, um, I gave up on that and then it really got, then my options were getting worse and you know, there, there, there wasn't many options left. And then my life did start going in front of me and I, I had kids here and living and then, and then if you believe in heaven, I always say this and it's really true. If you believe there's a heaven, my son James lived 10 days and died. He didn't even get a chance to sin at all. He never left the hospital. And my son Robert was 18 when he died. And, you know, we all do teenager stuff and kid stuff and, you know, take a cookie when we're not supposed to or whatever like that. But overall, he never sinned. So where would they be in heaven? Now, here's the question. Has Jim Bubba Bay done enough to go to heaven? I have no idea. You know, I I, I told you I was a Christian Christian. I was praying prayer of Jabez and, you know, my prayer and Christian music and, you know, it was becoming part of me. And yes, as a kid, my parents, see what happened was we were raised to go to church. And then we bought a house and my dad worked six days a week. And the only day we could work on the house is Sunday. So it took us like five years to gut this house and put new walls up. And so every Sunday was spent working on the house. So that's how we ended up, you know, falling away from church. But I, I didn't know if I did enough to go to heaven, but I figured my kids are there. They have to be there if you believe in it. And I believed in heaven. I don't care whatever, I, you know, how, how much of the Bible I knew or not, I, I believed in heaven. I believed in God and I believed in Jesus. I believed in the whole deal. So, you know, 
So I started thinking of all this stuff. And then you have my kids here living. And they're going to be without a dad. Because my options were down to nothing now. They were really like, like there was much. I, I was, I mean, I could, I'll say it now because it really magnifies how bad I was. I ended up fracturing my skull, brain bleed, concussion, traumatic brain injury. I broke my left scapula. I broke 11 ribs. I broke seven on the left, four on the right. And the four on the right never hit the ground. That's how hard I hit. They just mm. broke from vibration. I broke C7 two ways. And I broke T12 to T1. I broke nine of those. And I broke two of those two ways. So I broke 23 bones with 26 fractures. I had 13 fractures on my neck and spine alone. Yeah. So and it's a wonder people, you could even move at all if well, you weren't the, paralyzed. Yeah, that's the uh, the amazing thing. If 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 I I wasn't so I wasn't meant to. I, I struggled with um, I struggled with survivor's guilt for a while when I see people in a wheelchair because that just could have easily been me. But I would be dead if I was paralyzed. They mm -hmm. would have never found me. They would have had to get the dogs mm -hmm. because it turned out my mom and dad were going to go to town to find me because I don't mm -hmm. walk around here. So they would have had to go and I would have been. So anyway, so I, I had that much damage to make the magnify. The, and uh, when I do my speak, some people say, well, how much pain are you in? And I said, well, this is not really true. But has anybody broke a bone? And then some people are like, yeah, I broke a bone. I said, multiply that by 26 times. And that's how much pain I'm in. Yeah. And then I'm losing blood left and right. I mean, it's just gushing. So I decided, I didn't even know if I could move at this time, like physically my legs and nothing like that. So I decided real, you know, I decided that, and I know this is crazy and this is, uh, my faith and my hope were gone. They were, I'm not, they, they were. I, I just pretty much came to the conclusion I was going to die. I was dead. My options were death. Then what came to me, which really did come to me, is my wife, Yanina, at the time, finding her son dead after three or four days. And you can imagine what she saw. Mm -hmm. So I decided I didn't want people to find me dead like I was. Maybe if I get to the road, they would find me sooner and they would find me in the morning. Somebody would drive by, right? And I'd be dead on the lock and or, or, or road or whatever, and I'd be dead. So that's, so I decided that if I can move, I'm going to go to the road to die there. And I did. That was my, that was my goal. Mm. Get to the road to die. So you didn't and, want to be found. You wanted to be discovered and it might have been uh dying in that in that ditch that you might not have been discovered and so you're at this point your hope is that that you would be discovered uh dead or alive and more likely dead at this point yeah i was thinking i'd be dead uh I, the blood was gushing and just like the, and the amount of pain i of course i didn't know all that damage or what technically i brought with me i just was in all that pain and uh so but I did. I, I decided I moved the road to die. I knew, I, I literally did. I still got in the stand. I, I fell off the face of the earth. It's like someone opened up a, you know, all of a sudden open a hole and you fall. And that's what it felt like. So I have no, I still have no idea where I really am. I just know how it's going to find me. I never know this exists. I've never seen it before. So I ended up, uh, yeah. So then I decided that if I can move, I'm going to go road to die. So I was able to, look up a little bit now it's dark out no moon because and then it turned out to be real foggy and no lights and all like that and it, it's just amazing how i still i i i, I could tell that, that like there was a field to the on one side and there was this like silhouette of this big wall to, to to the one side and i had the you know the mindset or the wherewithal to say i had to come from that wall I had remembered I was walking at that time. I, that all started coming to me. And I said, that's where I came from, that wall. Hmm. And I said, well, if I can move, that's where I'm going. So you had this uh, this concept that that wall in front of you was a place that you had to to go to, that that was yeah, that, compelling that you. The silhouette, yeah, it was like, because the, the other side of me seemed kind of flat. And I'm like, well, how could I be hurting so bad if I fell on the flat? 
I must have come from this wall thing or whatever. And I couldn't see exactly what it was. And um, so I said, yeah, I said, that's where I got to go. So I kind of rolled, rolled on my side, which is was excruciating because I had broken ribs on both sides. So any kind of movement with that. And uh, but I was able to move a little bit. And I, I st to this day, I got to say one thing amazing. And maybe people say God, but on the climb, God wasn't there. There was no angels. It was just me. Me and the will to die. Um, it really was. I, I people, some people like, oh, must have came. No, that was a very painful, very, 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 very painful climb. But but it turned out to be a culvert and it has a wall and it has two little side walls. I was in the in the middle of these two side walls. And to this day, I have no idea, but I I crawled around the one side wall without even knowing to do that. I just got lucky as all can be. I didn't, I didn't, because if I went straight, I would have went into the sidewall and somehow I went backwards and around the sidewall. When I got by the wall, I could tell I was going up alongside of a wall. And uh, so I, I was like, okay, I'll go up, you know, so I got to this, 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 this hill. And that was the craziest climb of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, it was totally on my belly. Totally. No, I was blessed. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm a right-handed guy and I've been landscaping most of my life and I build rock walls and patios. And so I'm a strong guy and I didn't break my right arm, my right, right shoulder. That's my dominant thing. So I had that going for me and it turns out my legs weren't broken or nothing like that. They were cut up and stuff, but nothing, no major damage to my legs. And um, so I started crawling up the hill. And I would go up a little bit and I'd slide back a little bit. And it, and what's crazy, it's not the longest climb. It's a steep climb. And healthy people have gone there since then and tried to walk up where I went. And they and they have difficulty climbing mm -hmm. where I climbed. So, but the will, I, I really did. I had the will to die. That was my option. That was my option. You got to remember too, yes, I prayed prayer to the beds and all that stuff, but I didn't have this huge relationship with God, you know, and all that. I believed in it. I believed, I believed in all these near death stories before me. And, you know, I, I believed in all that stuff. I did. And I'd watch it on TV or whatever like that. And, you know, I knew about Noah's Ark and, you know, you know, I'd watch a movie and stuff like that. I, I did throughout when I listened to, them, but I, but, but I really wasn't, I wasn't sure where I was going. I didn't really think I was going anywhere else, but heaven, but you know, I, I didn't know for sure. But I, I had no option. I when I started to figure out I had walked on Hammertown Road, there were, it's a Sunday night. It ended up being 7 30, 8 o'clock. I don't know, even that time's a little helter skelter with the exact time. Everybody's home packing lunch, getting ready for work the next day. There's there's not many cars that go down Hammertown Road like that, you know, at that time of night. So the odds are somebody coming by or like that. It's so little. And so I said, I'll go to the road to die. So I climbed and I got up to a point and this is a real key to the whole event. I ended up coming to a log and I was able to lay on this log, pardon me, I was done. And thankfully this log showed up at the right time because I was done. I, I did all I could and I happened to tell I was near the road and I could see the silhouette of a flat, like really nice flat thing. And so I got to this log and I said, okay, now, uh, now I can die. And so that's where I, you know, that, that was at that point, that's, uh, I was still crying, bleeding, stuff like that. You know, I wasn't crying out loud in a sense no more. It was just tears. You know, they kept rolling down mm -hmm. your face. I'm, I'm sure some of it was emotional for my kids. Some of it was just downright pain, you know, just the pain of the, the all the crazy movement I'm doing. And, uh, I had enough. I had enough. So you were ready to die at that point, and it's in the dark, and and this log came out of nowhere, smooth log, um, and 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 you were ready. I mean, you had basically—I don't know if you gave up, but you were just were resigned to the probability that that this would be your last breath. Yeah, my uh, my faith and hope were zero. My tank was empty at that time. Uh, yeah, I was empty. I had no hope, no faith, you know, uh, and so I closed my eyes 
Yeah, I closed my eyes. Uh, I said, well, this must be how it happens. I didn't know how long it was going to take me to die like that. I was still breathing, you know, I was still breathing stuff. I just was like, okay, I'll be done. This is it. Um, that was my hope. I, but mm. I had zero. I, my faith was empty. My hope was empty. Everything was empty. I was just done. Mm. I, that, that climb just took everything out of me. And that's why I claim I had no help because that climb really just really took everything out of me. What, what, what I had left in me, it was done by the time I got to that road. And uh, I closed my eyes. Yeah. When you and closed then, your eyes then, Bubba, um, you were not going to open them for a while. And you had an experience that was miraculous. In fact, the title of your book, A Miracle on Hammertown Road, we'll get to in a bit. But there's a miracle in your future despite your having gotten to the point of death. Yeah, I just got goosebumps. So anyway, yeah. So when uh, they mentioned the book, and it's kind of cool you did, because uh, when we were writing for the book, my best friend, Mickey Ruzik, wrote it with me. I I'm the one that has part of the book I wrote, part of the paragraphs are mine. Some of them are all the same. He changed the word, but he's like the author author, you know, and he combined it all. And sometimes I've rambled on and he made it, you know, presentable to people to read and all that stuff. So anyway, and the cool thing was he, he lives in Bangkok, Thailand. And I was here, he had come home to visit. We were best friends in high school and he came home to visit. And then we talked and he, he knew I got hurt. And then he, we met each other at a grave graveyard, if anything, because we did graves at this one graveyard. And my brother was there. My brother, came and got me after the accident and said, Hey, you want to go to the graveyard? You could sit in the truck and just to get me out of the house, you know, cause when you're hurt that bad and you're in the hospitals and just to get out in fresh air, it feels good. So anyway, Mickey and I met there and then we did the book, but it came to this God thing in the book. And uh, I was trying to describe what happened next. And then it, it hit me, you know, and it happens to all of us. I think everybody living had this happen as kids. You know how when we oversleep, we have our eyes closed and then our mom and dad turn the lights on in our room and then like our eyes open because the lights are so bright. That's what happened to Bubba Bay on that log. Mm. It, it, that's exactly the scene that happened. I was content and dying and had my eyes closed and then holy cow, did it get so bright. It may, I yeah, just had to open your eyes. You just had to open them. And I opened wow. my eyes and... And it's nighttime, but you're being bathed in this light yeah. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it was incredible. It, it, it just, holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. It was all, like I, you, like you exactly said, it was pitch black and I opened the thing. And, and I want to say this right now, I, I did do a speech at a IANS conference. I went, uh, I, I was on a panel real quick. And this is a little amazing story. It's, it's amazing how God, I'm going to do a little sidetrack because this is an amazing little story. I went to this IONS conference, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And I, I went to be on a panel in, in Colorado. And I got there and I was there the whole first day. And everybody left their bodies and went to heaven and hung out with Moses and Jesus. And, you know, and I didn't go anywhere. Hmm. I didn't go anywhere. I stayed in my body and I was on Hammertown Road. And so I sat there and I said, I can't, I don't belong here. And here I'm going to speak on this panel. And I didn't leave my body. I, I just, I just, I don't belong here. I kept it to myself. My daughter went on the trip with me and I sat there the whole day feeling I didn't belong. The next day, Edmund Alexander was speaking in the main, main auditorium. And that's where I was going to speak on the panel. I was on the panel. It wasn't, they want Jim Bay. I was just part of a four-person, three-person panel, four-person. Anyway, I was part of this panel as one of the things. And uh, I wanted to listen to Eben Alexander. And my back was really bad. It was really bothering me that day. But those chairs in there were hurting me when I would sit in the one auditorium. And I said, but I really want to go. I'm going to go. My daughter was still doing her teenager get ready thing. And I said, I'm going down. Well, I got down there, and it's amazing how God works. I got down there, 
and they never had these doors open and they had the doors open and I got to sit in the motel lobby, one of the lobby part in those comfortable motel chairs, you know, those real cushy ones. So I sit down in this chair, I could see Evan Alexander on the stage and this woman sits across from me. This guy sat next to me, he was there and I asked him, do you mind me sitting down? He goes, no, no, sit down. And he didn't say anything to me. Next thing you know, like a couple minutes later, this woman shows up, sits across the way. And next thing she starts talking to me and saying, you want to believe this story? I had this crystal and she, they were big, she was big in crystals. And she goes, I got this crystal and I brought it here at this, this the store they have and I lost it. And would you believe it? Two, we, two days later, the crystal was on the table across from my elevator on my floor. My crystal. Isn't that amazing? And, and so she told me the story and I'm just listening and I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. And then she looks and there was uh, names like author, speaker, and, you know, experiencer. They had like plates, you know, and I had a, mm -hmm. my mind had all of that because I was a speaker, author, and uh, experiencer. And she looks over, she goes, oh, you're an author, speaker, and spirit. What happened to you? And I said, and I went to tell her. And then she, I said, I well, first I, I said, did you have one? She goes, oh, let me tell you about that. It turned out this woman's been going for 25 years at this conference and she had an in-body experience. And it was like, God said, here you go. And so I felt at home again. You know what I mean? I, I, I hmm. learned, I met somebody that had an in-body experience like I did. And it, it just made me, you know, it was like God's way of saying, here you go, you do belong, you know? So going back to the, to, I just wanted to bring that up. So I didn't leave my body. I didn't go anywhere. I never died. I never claimed to die. I was as near death as you could be. I do say I had one foot in death's door and one foot still here. You know, that's kind of where I was. Um, I That was it. I was dying. That was my thought. Mentally, I was dying, but I never died. I was still breathing. And I opened my eyes and the whole thing was lit up. And it, some people, you know, everybody sees something different, stuff like that. And some might be Hollywood kind of sounding, but for me, it was the whole shebang. It was the whole, and it got lighter and brighter and brighter and lighter and different colors. And it just like the whole, it was just illumination. It was unbelievable. And and the fact that it's pitch black on Hammertown Road to go to that is like, it's just mind boggling. Well, that's so, a true miracle. I mean, you were, you were in the presence of the light, but there was a person who is emanating that light you had seen through. And that this person that you knew uh, to be God also had two visitors for you. Yeah, yeah. So as I was laying there, next thing you know, as you say, and the other thing I got to say, before my accident, my spirituality was pretty small as far as um, light. Like just that the light showed up, I, I would, I, I, well, even when the light first showed up, I said, wow, this is how you go to heaven. That was my first thought. Like, wow, I don't know how to go to heaven. I'm not an expert, but is this, is this how it happens? You know? And, uh, but um, if the light just came on its own, Jim Bubba Bay would be dead at that log. Cause I would have no, I, I would have no concept of, of, of that. I would have no concept. If the light showed up as an orb, which some people see or whatever like that, I'd be dead on that log because I would have no concept. So the only way for Jim Bubba Bay to understand what's happening, remember I'm not this big scholar in the Bible or any of that stuff, is that this grandfatherly figure had to approach me. Or else I wouldn't be on that, I would be on that log. I'd be like, okay, I'm dying, I'm dead. That's what I needed. And that's what came, came closer and closer. It was this grandfatherly like figure, which I understood to be God. And again, at that point, before it was a talk within, it wasn't like me and you were talking, but it's within uh, talking to God is like that kind of talk. For me, it was. And before he even said anything, I still thought, wow, wow, they really throw the red carpet out to go to heaven. That's kind of my thought was still like, wow, I, you know, but anyway, <laughs> and as, as it got to be more, my eyes got to be able to handle it more. Uh, my kids were there, Robert and James, um, to the to the right of God. Uh, my left, his right, uh, were there. 
And they look like I remember them. Uh, and this was years later, so uh, about three years later. So, but they all looked when I, how I remember them. But maybe I think that's what I needed too. You know, I needed that. Uh, to fast forward, now I know they had a destiny uh, to be there that night to meet me. Uh, you had asked, do I get mad at God that they died? Or I never did, but that was part of their destiny was I was going to, because I'm a believer in that. We all, you know, it kind of happens, you know, stuff happens and it happens for a reason. And uh, they, but they were there. And uh, the one thing that helped me is I knew what I was seeing came from heaven. Because like I told you, my son was 10 days, you know, how could he sin? James and Robert was 18 years old. So they had to come from heaven. I, I was positive on that, you know? And so then God approached and they got closer and closer. And then I was just in awe. I was in awe. Mm -hmm. uh, my pain, God didn't like heal me or take the pain away, but I was in such awe that the pain subsided some. It became, my mind wasn't like, I just wasn't thinking about the pain. And then uh, we had a conversation my meeting with God was like you and me meeting on the road and saying hello and talking for a few minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes. But that's all Jim Bubba Bay needed. I didn't need any more. I didn't need to go to heaven. I didn't need to go anywhere. That's what I needed. And going back to, I want to say real quick, the reason why I don't know the Bible is I always question all this death and killing over the Bible. And if it's really God's word, how can all this dying and death and all this killing really be? So that's why I didn't read the Bible. And I argued with people and I would tell people and I'm like, well, it can't be God's word because God's good and healing and healthy and happiness. And yeah, stuff happens. But overall, the gist of the thing is, yeah, that was my reason why I didn't know the Bible, read the Bible. Uh, and uh I tell everybody, if you're going to meet God or Jesus, whatever you want to say you met, you, you, if you had a big question, your number one question that you thought for many years, now this is many, many years, this is my thought about the Bible. He's going to answer it. <laughs> He's going to answer it. So that night I got the answer that, that as we know, if, if, all these people take Bible men, take Bible to, to, to benefit them. Uh, all different throughout history, they've taken the Bible to benefit them and they're no longer in power. They're no longer existing. Some of their, the cultures are very little or not at all, but they abuse the Bible, you know, to do things with and, you know, interpret it the way they want to interpret it. And they're no longer in power or in position to be a power. And yet, you know, now it's 2023 and God's still as powerful as he ever been. Jesus is you know, Jesus God. And the Bible is still his word. The Bible carries on, in other words. And it's us men that interpret it and use it for our own power and our own good. That And yes, it might be good for a few years, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. I'm not a scholar in the Bible. I'm not a historical guy either. But if you look at it, they all fall by the wayside. Eventually, eventually they like they killed all those scientists back in the day over the Bible. Oh, no, that's voodoo, voodoo, voodoo. You know what I mean? And all that stuff. Well, it's God's word that it should be OK that they're, you know. So anyway, and some of, you know, some pre, you know, with all different religions did stuff, you know, and, and yeah, he still carries on. And the um, it's true that many interpret or use the Bible even and. Uh, the Bible even states that Satan himself can uh, use scripture for his own purpose, that they can translate it to accommodate their own opinion. Yeah. Uh, but the inspiration from the word of God is one that brings uh, the presence of the Lord through the truth that is spoken. And sometimes a, a particular verse can speak um, uh, to somebody in a very profound way another person might read that same verse and it doesn't mean a whole lot to them 
but it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that brings it to to life. And even if I struggled as well, uh, Bubba, uh, I was an agnostic in my in my uh, youth, and I struggled because I, you know, was thinking of the Old Testament, and you know, we tried to disprove the uh, the Bible actually at uh, at a major university. Uh, and I was thinking, God, if if He's that if He's that way. And not the God of love is also is expressed as one of the names for God. Uh, that that that's not the God that I that, that I particularly want to be close to because I'm uh, He's angry at me. Uh, yeah, he doesn't yeah. like me. Um, but I think what what uh, the truth shows is that God was protecting in the many of those cases His people, and uh, many were marauders and. They were destroying the people at the time, and God intervened to uh, to save those people. But all things aside, you came to a peace, Bubba, um, of with God uh, that maybe some would say, "Well, it's kind of a last minute conversion," but it really was God revealing Himself in a way uh, that was showing that love to you. Uh, the lost sons were there, confirming that love. He was. That the light of Jesus Christ, which is also expressed within the Bible, and you were seeing that. But what's unique, I think, about your experience, Baba, is that you had what you have termed an in-body experience. I did. That is your 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 spirit, your your soul was still in your body, and you were observing this external to yourself. Uh, but what you were going to be entering into then subsequent to this, when you were eventually found is you would go into a coma for several days. So you were in this kind of state of being mesmerized by the light and the appearance of your sons by God. Um, but then you did fade into what would eventually be, um, a coma. What was that like? Well, let me just quick say that because it's real key to the story. So God, we, 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 we had a conversation for a little, little bit. Like I said, it was quick and seemed quick and stuff. And then he left and it got real dark, you know, dark again. And the pain came back and the funny and I'm, I'm funny, nothing. But, but anyway, the funny thing about it is he never told me what to do. I, I didn't know. He just said I had things to do for him and things that I, it wasn't my time and to do this and listen you know, and uh, but he didn't tell me how I was going to be saved there and like that. So here I am on Hammertown Road in the dark again, and okay, no no cabs are going to go by, no no you know nothing. So I I know it's some Bach and it's crazy, but I ended up turn. I was able to turn my head a little bit. And I saw this little light in this house. I said that's where I got to go. I know it sounds crazy to go to the light, but I said that's where I got to go, and uh, it looked far away. And then I said, well, if I crawl, I die. So I got to get up. So I tried to get up once and I fell. Uh, the pain, the gravity just took over all the broken bones. And then I said, well, if you get up, you got to get up again. And once you're up, you got to stay up. So I actually got up again and, uh, and a hunchback kind of thing. And I shuffled my feet down the road towards this house. And I fi- and then I got to the lawn. The lawn was a little, it's a little tiny hill, but it was like Mount Everest then. And I ended up climbing up the lawn. It ended up being my neighbor's house. I never... I always waved towards a neighbor, but I remember I just moved here a little while ago or whatever at the time. And I, I, I never talked, you know, and I, uh, so I, uh, I knocked on that poor woman's door and the crazy time and wise with God, he, he, uh, she wasn't home when I fell, she arrived, at, you know, after like I fell and while I was trying to climb the, she, she got home then. Cause if she wasn't home, I was dead for sure. I don't care what God said. There was no climbing to my house. There was, you know. So anyway, I knocked on her door. I passed out on her lawn and they kept me too. And I was coming in and out of consciousness. And uh, it took them over an hour to get me off the lawn. I bled so much on her lawn. They got buckets of water and soaked the lawn down and stuff like that. And so I ended up going to the hospital. But while I was met the God at the log, I was able to describe the log that I saw. I, it, it, you know, those logs that lose the bark and no branches. It's like a telephone pole. I was on that kind of log. So that's where I met God at. So I ended up going into a coma, which was a whole different world. I write about it in the book. Obviously, it was a drug-induced coma, and uh, it was a whole different world. I didn't go to heaven. It wasn't heaven stuff. Um, in the book, I have a, 
I had a friend that got me through the seven days I was in the coma, a scarecrow friend named Sam. Uh, I would pack a lunch and walk down the road and we, he, he would sit on the side of the thing and we would talk sports and politics. And it's crazy, this stuff. I, it was a whole different world and it was all drug induced, of course. But uh, I, um, he got me through the seven days of the coma and we uh, met every day and had lunch and obviously it was fake lunch, but it felt real. And we talk and he'd tell me about the Yankees and the Mets and he'd bring a paper and here I thought the paper was real and the news and all that stuff. So and, were, were uh, you hearing this while you were in the coma or what was that like? Yeah, it was just, I, 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 yeah, it was, it was live as me and you right now, this whole world of this coma. There, there's other stuff, not so good stuff that were happening. I thought was happening. So that didn't make the book because you know, it was all just my mind, you know, but yeah, yeah. It was as live as me and you right now. I mean, he, the, and he kept me up to date on the dates and the times and, I hung out by this field and oh man, it was, it, what, what a world. It was great. Other than those really wild, not so great things. I, I thought a couple of nurses were trying to kill me and that's a whole nother story, you know? So mm. there was some bad little weird things going on there, but most of it was peaceful. And this, my scarecrow friend, Sam really helped me out. And then I, they woke me up out of the coma and, uh, my, my aunt got mad at me. Sadly, she passed away, but I would go to do these interviews. I did some TV interviews. She was with me once and she says, you always downplay the amount of pain you're in. I said, well, 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 I don't know. I don't know how to. And she said, the reason why they put you in a coma, they didn't develop pain, a, a pain medicine to take away your pain. There's not one made by man lean that could take away all my pain. 26 fractures, you know? So she said they had to induce a coma or else you were not going to make it, you know? So I got out of the coma and then, it hit me quickly that I met God. You know, I came back to a nurse, uh, Angel came to the hospital, very brief, very brief moment. She came from the wall side. There was no nurses in the room. It was just me. And this angel showed up and I'm like, Oh, okay. And so, but I already been thinking I saw God. It was really true. I was 99%, 99.5% sure it really happened for me. It really happened. And then this, angel came and said hey you know you got things to do for god and real brief real brief everything's been brief you know it's like just enough just enough to you know so of course after seeing her i was like oh okay i'm pretty sure it really happened so i decided to tell my family one at a time and i forget how it went like because only a few could come in at a time and when they were by themselves i told like my dad my mom my sister my brother and i forget what order they got told them and I got told a couple things that there was a lot of blood at a log. It was obviously I stopped at a log because my cousin, it's a long story. It's all part of the book, but he was a sheriff. He followed my blood trail to see where I fell. You know, my own cousin. And that's how wrecked I was. He didn't even know it was me on the lawn till my brother showed back up. And he and he was very close to me. And, and he said to my brother, John, my cousin, Rich, said, what are you doing here, John? John said, that's Jim over there. And he had no idea. That's how wrecked I was from the accident. Mm. Fall. So anyway, he, he uh, discovered where I fell and all that stuff. And uh, there was a lot of blood at this log. So everybody, like my whole family said, you stopped at a log. There was a lot of blood there. And I said, that's where I met God at. And mm. I still was like 99. Now I'm 99.8. But again, my parents and my brother, you know, they're all, they just want to make sure, hey, if you claim to meet God, you better make sure you met God. You know, you don't want to be lying or falsifying anything. I said, no, I'm really positive I met God. But it was still amongst my family. And my niece, Genesis, uh, I don't know if you know about Karen Bridge website, but it's uh, it's a really great nonprofit thing. You can create a, a little website within their page and everybody gets notices. Hey, something new happened with Jim and email would go out and then you could see the update. So my sister-in-law, Marianne, and my brother, John, ran the page. And uh, they put pictures of where I fell on the page. So I was in rehab at this time. I, I was only in the hot, and this is an amazing thing. I had no operations. All I had was a vena catheter filter put in me. And I think, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think I was hurt so bad that if you wanted to operate, I probably wouldn't last the night anyway. Uh, I have two crushed vertebrae. I lost two inches from my fall. Um, they healed that way. Uh, but uh you you uh 
So I, I didn't have any. So I, I was in the hospital. I got up on the third week. I, they, I had the full cast shell and the neck brace. And I walked around with a walker around the unit. And they're like, you're out of here. Because they don't want you to get sick on top of everything else you're dealing with. And because I had so many orthopedic injuries, I went the orthopedic route, not the brain injury route. And um, so I ended up uh, doing the orthopedic thing. And in rehab, they have computers. So my brother and sister-in-law were there one night and one day. And they're like, hey, you want to see your web page? People are talking all over the world. I said, all right. So they wheeled me in. And uh, we looked at the computer. And I finally saw it for the first time. And then my brother says, you want to see where you fell? And I wasn't know if I was ready to see where I fell. And then I said, okay. And he shows me the picture that was taken that morning after I fell. You can't see the blood on the log, but there's a log in the picture that I described straight out of a coma that I met log, I met God at in the dark. But it was so bright out and there's no traffic light. There's no street lights. There's no house lights and there's no moonlight because it was so foggy. They, they were going to fly me in a helicopter. That's how bad I was, but they couldn't fly. So they mm -hmm. had to take me by ambulance. So there's wow. no, and there's no car light because I'm that close to the road. You would have stopped. I don't care who you are. I was a bloody mess. I don't know if you wanted to stop, but you would have stopped. And uh, so what other light could there be that are described straight out of a coma? This log exists in the picture. And I still have copies of the picture of the log. Mm. It, it's in, And so the log's the whole incredible story part of the whole story because it's it's how i i couldn't describe it anybody in this world we all could go out in the dark and lay in a log but can you really describe it and because it got so bright and god was there i I can't move a lot but i was able to you know the little bit of movement i did i could tell i was on this log no bark no branches yeah so wow. then i was 100 percent. yeah i was all in you had numerous miracles uh happen the grandest of all is to see God with uh, your two sons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and God was uh, giving you that peace and assurance that they were with him in, uh, in heaven. So that's a, that's a great gift. Now, did you, uh, last question before we introduce your book, if those would like to read it and uh, learn more about your story, uh, do you have any other repercussions physically from, from your accident? But this was a major accident that, you know, the mir other miracles that uh, a lot of people that, or if not most people, have had your type of accident was, would be in a wheelchair or worse. I I, um, I have chronic pain, but to see me, you would have no idea I broke 26 fractures. I'm full-time landscaping again. I build walls. Uh, you know, well, I, I do it all still. Um, I do have chronic pain, but I was a believer maybe, but I was a believer that I don't know. So many stories happen where people meet God or have a, you know, divine intervention and they, they were a horrible painter. And now that they're this great painter and stuff like that, I, as we had said earlier in the interview real quick, I was a shy guy. I could talk. Once you knew me, if I knew you, I could talk your ear off. All us bays could talk, but I was a shy guy. So my classmates, they, some of my close friends are like, no, you're not shy. You never, but I was, I was a, I was 40 something years old, afraid to use the phone. I literally did. I, I was, wow. you know, I just was like a shy, afraid to use the phone, afraid to make a motel appointment. Uh, I'd have my wife do it. And, you know, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm that, that, that was me. I'm not ashamed to say it. I, I give you all, I give you all, I give all I can, but that was me. So wow. I, so I have chronic pain, but I overcome it. I take no pain meds, nothing. I went cold turkey and all that. And I just live with it because you take all that stuff and it kills your kidney and your liver. Well, what, what good are you? And of course, my son dying of kidney disease. I know how valuable those are. And um, but so you get a gift. I really believe it. So I gave up chronic pain and I got I call it the gift of sociability because I talked to everybody and anybody. I've been on TV shows. Uh, I talk, I do inspirational speaking. I was in Virginia Beach in September and last September talked at two places and I, 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 I have no fear. No, not one fear. And I wow. talk to everybody. And if I see you eating an ice cream cone in the Sam's Club or Walmart, I'll, I'll you know, hey, what flavor you got there? I talk to everybody. I, I got this. <laughs> and my kids are with me. I embarrass them. Uh, we, we were, you know, how big Walmarts are. 
it was raining out that day and we had pushed around and got our stuff and uh, we were in the middle at the checkout but we had just got done and this old lady came in this little old lady come in for a car and they had just pushed them all in you knew they were all soaked i yelled at the top of my youngs hey lady hold on we got a car warmed up for you loud as i could and everybody's looking and stuff and you know my kids are like you know covering their head like oh here we go dad's on his roll and uh, i you know and she appreciated we gave her the cart it's all nice and dry and she was you know she was an older lady and she loved it and that that's me and and, and what a world that was the gift I, i'll tell you i'm so blessed just for that fact alone talking to you meeting you i would never do this never mm. never do anything like this and um what, what a different world when you're outgoing and stuff like that and you know talking to everybody and uh, and, and I never talk about my story. To see me, you have no idea. I did walk with a cane for a while because I had got dizzy from my brain injury. Um, but I slowly got over that. And uh, you wouldn't know it. And, my, and I got a big head of hair. And my head's all caved in. It's so funny. I got my hair cut one time. And uh, it's all got a big scar up there. And if you cut my hair short enough, you can see it. So the hairdresser lady goes, she gets to the point where she sees the scar. And she says, oh, I see you got a scar here. It's probably one of those, uh, when you're a kid, you hit your head on the coffee table stories. I said, no, it's a little bit more involved than that. And I got a short <laughs> version. I got a, oh. I got a little two minute version of the whole story. I can tell quick and, but I never say anything to anybody about the book. I, I, I and God just, you know, and puts people in front of me and I get sent places where, um, my intuition, I, I ignored it once after the accident and no more. It was mm. horrible that day that I ignored it. And uh, it, it's really God talking to me. To, and sometimes it's I, I need to meet people. We all still, you, you do Lord's work, you do God's work, but you still need refueling yourself to meet people, you know, other people. And they, they keep us fueled and I got to meet people like you and other people. So sometimes I go and it's, it's for me. It's just all for me to feel better, feel good or whatever like that. And, but a lot of times it's people that meet me. You just see me, you would have no idea what I've been through. It, you, you wouldn't even know so and i never said in anybody and boy do they god make sure it comes out somehow and there's like three or four stories in the book of how it all stuff came out and wasn't me to start it you know but it just it like here's the door and it's like okay and, oh all right I'll, i guess i'll have to tell you my story you know yeah so well um uh, it's amazing what happens and tra uh, transforming a person when they meet God, <laughs> it's <incredible>. it changes, <laughs> it changes, you know, and, and, uh, I just want to ask you this final question. Then we'll go to prayer, uh, which is one of my favorite times. Uh, where can people find your book, a miracle on Hammertown road, by the way, we'll have a link on the body of this message. So you can order that book on Amazon, but, uh, where else would, might it uh, be available? It, it, I believe it's still it's in Barnes and Noble website too and stuff, but it is on Amazon's the main site and it's a it's a uh, paperback book. It's an audio on Audible as an audio book and it's an ebook and it's an ebook in uh, Barnes and Noble. Their their Nook thing too. Or I I forget whatever ones they do. <laughs> I don't know, but that that's the main thing. I have copies myself and I, I my website is jimbubbabay.com. It, it's not updated because I I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, when the COVID happened, I had to stop spending and I had a friend that was updating it for me. And so, it, but I keep it active so that, but, and I used to sell it through the, my website, but I, I don't do that anymore. So the main spot is Amazon and then Barnes and Noble. And um, you could, order, you know, I'm sure if you really didn't want to go those route, a bookstore can get it. it. It's, it's in the book, you know, like if you go to your bookstore and say, Hey, can you get this book? They can order it. It's, it's right. available all that way and stuff, you know? Right. But those are the main, you know, and then it's available in like our library system and uh, tons of people read the book. I, and I, I'm a horrible salesman. I give a lot away. I, I don't care. I give them to homeless people and, you know, and then I've had one homeless guy come back and tell me how great the, the book was and it helped spend, it gave him time to read and stuff. And, you know, and uh, we said a little prayer together and stuff. All, all that stuff is great. That's my, actually, my favorite thing is meeting everybody. My favorite thing is meeting all the people. Though. And the and the stories that people have are incredible. Uh, these people come and I, I just, they come to me with these incredible stories. 
and, mm. and and this guy got hit by a car i sat down the old me wouldn't have sat down in barnes and noble but i asked him can i sit at this table which it almost seemed like it was two tables but they were all close together and he's like yeah sit down so i'm typing away doing my stuff and he's like what are you doing i said oh i'm just trying to promote my book or whatever like that oh what's i said oh i just had near oh let me tell you you know got hit by a car and he's there he is living and just all that stuff so yeah but i love it it's meeting people in my favorite you know <laughs> well i've interviewed a number of them been hit by cars and all kinds of uh yeah uh you know tragedies that uh not just survive were survived but in yeah. their encounter with the uh the living god of yeah, jesus correct. christ so um, also, just for a point of clarification to our audience, uh, there are different experiences that one may have in an afterlife experience, as I had my own, of course, as we talked about, uh, Baba. Um, you had in the Bible, you had Paul had uh, uh, an in-the-body experience <laughs> with God on the road to Damascus. That's a famous one. Uh, he was uh, converted or transformed, certainly, through that. Uh, there's the experience that Moses had looking at the backside of God. There's uh, the so-called transfiguration, which is when the disciples had seen uh, Jesus uh, talking, who was walking with them previously, talking with Elijah and Moses. So, uh, And then there are people like myself and some others that we've interviewed with who had uh, what one would term certainly an out-of-body experience. Um, so I know there's a plethora, it's not to confuse anybody, but just to say that God works in miraculous ways and ways that are specific to the person, just as we talked about the Bible speaks specifically to somebody. Uh, one verse can mean be an epiphany for someone and then just be, um, you know, a, a verse in the Bible. Now, now it's time, Baba and, and uh, uh, we're enjoining in prayer for you because Here's, here's the, the final word on that, and then I'll uh, give a thanks uh, to Bubba for a phenomenal sharing and testimony. Uh, and that is that uh, if, if you would like to have an encounter with a God of Jesus Christ, uh, then uh, Jesus made it very simple, uh, but also he made it very powerful. And that is uh, he hung on the cross. Uh, he willingly went there. He could have called legion of a legions, legions of angels, literally thousands of angels to save him, but he didn't because he did it for you. And if you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and savior, uh, then, then just confessing that like each of us, you've fallen short, you've sinned, you've done bad things. I have. And, uh, uh, Jesus sacrificed himself for you so that he can uh, reside in you vis-a-vis -vis the Holy Spirit. So if you pray a prayer like this, dear Lord, I, I ask that you would forgive me. I know I've done wrong and I know you want to forgive me and I know you hung on that cross to forgive me if I only I would ask. And also I give my all to you. I give over my life to you. You are my Lord and my Savior. I ask that you would just fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I might honor you all the days of my life. So that on that day that I do enter a heaven permanently for eternity, I can live with you. And I can visit, uh, I can visit uh, these two young men, Robert and James, up there. Uh, and I can uh, meet you face to face as, uh, as my friend Bubba has and as I have and many others with whom I've interviewed. So uh, there's a celebration going on for you right now uh, because you are destined for heaven. And Baba, I wanna thank you so, so very much for uh, sharing this amazing story with us. Thank you for having me. I, I, thank you, I've been blessed. Thank you very much. Well, your story has blessed me and I know countless others as well. So, um, Bubba, we have some, uh, my normal sign off, which is some great news for those who are indeed in Christ Jesus. Um, then the great news is be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. <laughs> take, take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like, and subscribe. 
And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.